Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us is local health coach and fitness coach, Michelle Kester. And she has a wonderful topic tonight about healing your relationship with food and body. Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. Yes, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. I am happy to be here. So yes, um, shall I get going? Get rolling? Yes, you may. Okay. All right. So yes, as Elizabeth said, um, I'm grateful to be here. And hello and welcome to all of you. The goal of the presentation today is really to teach you how I personally broke free from years of struggling with yo-yo dieting and binge eating and body shame and really came out of that to having a healthier relationship with food and my food and my body um, and how I'm able to help my clients do the same. And this theme of the month for Marlene's is about mental health. And I think a lot of people, when they think about diet and nutrition, they think very just physical and about the food. But the reality is I see some of the greatest transformations and healing happen in our behaviors when we change how we think and we actually look at the mind. So that's what we're gonna look at today. And I hope that I can leave with you with something powerful to really help in your life. So now if you're hearing all that and you're still wondering if this is the right place for you to be, um, I want to let you know this event is for you if you're someone who maybe you try really hard to eat healthy a lot of the time but oftentimes you end up finding yourself like overeating when you don't want to or cheating on the weekends and holidays and you do that despite knowing that you don't want to and knowing that maybe you shouldn't okay or maybe you just find that there's certain foods that you just cannot have around in the house or you're just gonna eat them all. It's just all or nothing for you. Or maybe you just feel like you're guilty a lot of the time when you just wanna have a treat. Um, you feel shame and guilt around food and you don't wanna feel that way anymore. Maybe you wanna have a more balanced way of eating where you don't have to feel guilt but you also don't overdo it. Um, and maybe you're just tired of short-term diets that really, you know, don't last, <laughs> but you keep going on them because you don't know another way. Um, and maybe you just wish that you had some self-control, some trust in yourself around food so you can take care of your body without that all or nothing mentality and without that kind of ever consuming tracking and dieting mindset. So if you can relate with any of those, and if they sound like you, then you're in the right place, okay? Um, so I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, as you heard, I am a health and fitness coach. My name is Michelle. I go by Michelle Ho, that's my new name. I was Kester before I got married about a year ago. Um, and so about five years ago, I overcame my own struggle with yo-yo dieting, um, binge eating and really just being obsessed with food in my body. And since then, I've been able to develop a process based on that experience that I had, as well as working with clients over my eight years personal training, um, as well as mentoring with some amazing coaches and health experts. Um, so now I've been able to use that process to help over a dozen individuals, men and women, go from years or decades of struggling with binge eating and overeating and emotional eating and yo-yo dieting and also obsessing about food in their bodies to really living a healthy lifestyle that's balanced where it's free, where it's peaceful, where it's sustainable and they don't have to be obsessed with it all the time. Um, and besides that, I've also been able to help many women, men and women have breakthroughs in their health and fitness overall. Um, so whether that's actually just in exercising consistently, and again, in a way that's balanced and not obsessive, whether that's building strength and muscle, um, whether that's just falling in love with their bodies for the first time in decades. Um, so that's where I am at now. But like I said, it hasn't always been this way. Um, just a few years ago, it was actually just about five years ago, um, I was, I think, in the same place that many of you are. 
um, or at least a similar, similar place. So that time of my life was really frustrating um, because it was the time when I was actually trying my very, very hardest to be my very healthiest. Um, I had great intentions. I would eat um, as healthy as I could all day. Um, I was honestly, I was the skinniest I've ever be been. Um, and I was at the same time, though, very afraid of gaining all that weight back. I was constantly afraid of it. And so I would start my day off with really great intentions, eating all that good food. But at some point, um, it was usually in the evening for me, although I know for some people it's different times a day, but for me around 4 or 5 p.m., it was like I just turned into another human being, like this other part of my brain took over and all I wanted to do was eat. I didn't care about all my promises to myself. I didn't care about healthy eating anymore. I call this screw it Ville or F it land for many of us. And so I continually find myself at the end of the day in my room alone, eating bowls and bowls of ice cream. You'd find me at the bottom of that pint, not just part way through um, bunches of cereal, really whatever I could get my hands on. Okay, so this cycle would just kind of repeat itself. There were periods where I didn't have that problem, but over and over it kept happening. And I would just be filled with guilt and shame. Um, I hated how it ruined my sense of kind of trust in myself. Like I, I could manage other parts of my life, but this part just, it took a toll um, on my mental health. So how did I actually break free from this? Um, <laughs> first of all, in short, I actually just stopped doing a lot of the things that I learned from the fitness industry and that the fitness industry encouraged, even as my training, even my training as a personal trainer. And I'll explain that to you by kind of sharing a few of the mistakes that I made along the way. So the first mistake, or at least one of the first mistakes I made was when I was a freshman in college. Um, and I had gained the typical freshman 15, if you're familiar with that. Um, and at the time I was honestly using food to cope with the anxiety, the, the fear of not measuring up, the loneliness of being off at school for the first time. Um, I was using it to procrastinate on schoolwork. And at one moment, I remember uh, lying on my dorm room floor and I was just finishing the final words to an essay. It was like 11.58 PM and the essay was due at midnight. And I remember hitting that send button at that 1158 mark. And I looked around me and there were Pop-Tart wrappers all over the place, empty Pop-Tart wrappers. And it's because I had been procrastinating on that essay with all of my eating. And in that moment, I made a decision. I thought, okay, well, you know what? You know what you do when you eat too much? Well, what you need to do is you need to burn calories, right? I just need to burn this off. So. I started running and um, I started running regularly. I was actually really quite disciplined and this actually made me lose weight. I lost that freshman 15, but it didn't help the underlying problem. My binge eating actually got worse. My drive to eat actually got worse and my obsession with food actually increased. And so my mental health was worse <laughs> and I was exercising more. Um, so here's the mistake I made. I thought exercising more would fix an emotional eating problem, and it didn't. So a couple years later, I made, a, made another mistake. So I thought to myself, you know what? Today's the day. I am going to throw out all of the foods I would normally binge on, all of the snacks, all of the sweets. I don't know if any of you have done this before, but I hear it all the time. I threw out all the bad foods because keeping bad foods out of your house is a good idea, right? It'll prevent you from eating them. The fitness industry talks about this all the time. Stay on the perimeter of the grocery store so you don't eat the foods, the snack foods in the middle, right? Um, but that didn't work very long. And if you've done that before, I bet it hasn't worked very long for you. It's not sustainable. 
And for me, I remember that very day at that evening mark around 4 or 5 p.m., I actually found myself in the kitchen and I was reaching into the cupboard to grab my roommate's, my housemate's cereal box to eat from it because I was so desperate. I'd thrown out all this food and yet I was still needing to binge. So the problem was still there. I still had that shame around food. I still had that lack of trust in myself. So just avoiding foods that you feel like you can't control yourself around, again, it doesn't solve a problem of having no trust around food in yourself. So the last mistake I wanna share with you was a few years later. Um, I was now out of college. I had just started uh, my career as a personal trainer and I was helping my clients with, you know, with their fitness, with their exercise. I was really good at that stuff. Um, but when it came to the food, I didn't really touch that area with my clients because I honestly felt like a fraud. Um, I struggled with it massively. And so, but I did try one more thing. I thought, okay, you know what? I teach my clients that they need accountability. They need me to hold them to their new habits, right? So I probably need that. So I asked my colleague to hold me accountable and I told her I'd give her $50 every time I binged or overate. So it was just about getting myself to do something I didn't want to do. <laughs> and after a few hundred dollars, you know what? I realized that wasn't going to work either. Okay, so this mistake to summarize is I thought that trying to get myself to do something I didn't want to do and then having a punishment for not doing it was gonna help a problem rooted in shame, but it doesn't. Punishment just creates more shame. Okay, so after all these times of failing, um, there were of course, like I said before, there were months, there were even years where I was like either a little better or I just kind of ignored the issue or I was like flying high on some diet or program and thinking I was doing pretty good for a while. Um, I made up for what I ate a lot with long distance running. I was a runner in college. I often ran 40 to 50 miles a week. I worked out six to seven days per week. I counted all my calories. I measured them to the last ounce. Um, and, you know, people will say you can, you can't exercise your way out of a diet, a bad diet. Um, but I did, <laughs> I did in a way, because I stayed thin. But there was a massive cost and the cost was largely, I mean, it was on my, largely on my mental health. It was also on my physical health and I'll get into that later. But um, just the cost of like feeling constantly like this fraud, especially since I tried on the outward to look like someone who's fit and healthy. Um, it costed me my trust in myself because day after day I was telling myself I would do one thing and then doing another. It costed me um, emotionally. Um, I continued to procrastinate. I continued to feel like this ever-growing anxiety and shame that I never dealt with. And it really just stole my life away in the sense that it stole out of my headspace. Um, I was constantly worried about what I was going to eat, when I was going to eat, how much I was going to eat, how I was going to make sure I ate the right amount to lose weight, to prevent weight gain. Um, it took so much of my headspace all of the time. So it was really just lot, causing me to live a smaller life. So here I have a question for you that I really want you to just reflect on. Um, and you can write it down if you want, write down the notes. But what is yo-yo dieting? What is focusing constantly on weight loss? What is this, your relationship with food actually costing you in your mental health and your physical health. What is this cycle costing you? Okay, so now you know a bit about what didn't work. So I'll share with you now what actually did. I think that's probably more what you're here for, right? So I've got another question for you to kind of start this out. Do any of you know that you're the kind of person who would do way more for others 
than you would do ever for yourself. If you're that kind of person, you can nod your head to yourself, wave your hand, whatever. That was definitely me. And I'm not really, it is me. <laughs> I know myself to be that way. Um, so as I told you before, when I was a trainer, um, I was mostly avoiding the food area with my clients. And at one point, my boss at the time, he was really adamant. He was like, I really want you to work on nutrition with clients. I can't have you avoiding that area. And so up until that point, I've kind of gotten by, scraped by without it. But when he asked me that, it lit something up in me because I thought to myself, okay, he's asking this of me. I need to do something about this. But I can't help these people with this until I fix the problem in myself. And so I thought, okay, well, it kind of went back to some of the same thinking here, but I was like, well, at least I need some accountability. But what I really needed, I just needed some support. I needed some something to get me out of this. And so I ended up hiring a coach. And fortunately for me, that coach was fantastic because although she didn't specialize in disordered eating, binge eating, anything like that. She was a life coach. And what she did know was how to help me change the way I thought. And that massively helped my mental health, which therein helped everything else. So her strategy was really quite simple. Um, she used some common sense <laughs> to help me notice some things I wasn't noticing that were actually, that I was doing that were creating the problem in the first place. Um, she taught me how the brain works, and she taught me how to actually separate my automatic habitual thoughts from my more conscious ones, the real me, the me that wanted to change. And she was really just there every step of the way. Um, she didn't use punishment. She was cheering me on. She was holding me accountable. Okay, so as a result of working with her, three months later, I was able to stop binge eating. I've never looked back. So I've been about five years totally free now. Now, healing my relationship with food was great, really great. Um, but what came from that was, I think, even better. Um, because now I had my confidence and trust in myself back when it came to food. Now I was able to start working on other things. Like I had some gut-related issues and problems, food sensitivities, IBS. I've been able to actually investigate that and go on different gut health protocols without worrying about myself just falling off the wagon or not following the protocols that I needed to follow. Um, I was able to also start my own coaching practice and help others with this problem. I was able to start dealing with some of my emotional issues and actually healing some of my anxiety um, because I wasn't now numbing it anymore with food. So, and then of course I got that headspace back. <laughs> so like just normal everyday activities, hanging out with friends, going to the restaurant, going to birthday parties without worrying about the food or how I looked all the time. It was just completely liberating to have that amount of headspace. So I have another question for you here. What could you accomplish if food, exercise, and diet was no longer a worry or concern of yours. If you just didn't have to worry about it anymore, you could just trust yourself. What could you do? What would be available to you? Okay, so be thinking about that and you can write it down. You can go into it a little bit more later. Next, I want to take you through is I told you a little bit about what my coach did, but I want to give you a little more detail here. Um, I'm going to share with you the three keys that in the end were really what made all the difference for me. Um, they're honestly what I wish I would have known when I went through this journey, journey of struggling with my body and struggling with food. And they're not just what my coach taught me five years ago, they're also what I've learned since then that have honestly made my relationship with food even better. What I've learned about what's worked and what hasn't worked with clients, what's really been able to allow me to help them overcome 
struggles with food over and over again consistently. Okay, so here we go. Key number one, there is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with you. So you don't lack willpower. <laughs> you don't need more discipline. Okay, as you may recall, um, I tried really hard to kind of fight myself. I tried to make up for my problems. I tried to um, make up for what I ate. I thought there was really honestly something wrong with me. But the more I tried to fight against myself and the desires inside me and my urge to eat, um, the harder it actually was. So fighting against yourself doesn't work. <laughs> And it doesn't work because you're fighting against the way your brain works. So the way your brain works, I wanna help you kind of see that with an actual like picture here. So think about this. If I tell you, say I'm your fitness coach, you just hired me, you decide to work with me, okay? And I'm like, all right, starting tomorrow, you're not gonna eat any more ice cream. No more ice cream. So what do you wanna to do tonight before tomorrow happens? Don't you wanna eat your last bit of ice cream? So this is just the way the brain works. This is just human nature. I'll give you another example. Um, if I say to you, don't think about a purple elephant, what can you not help but picture in your head now, but a purple elephant, right? Your brain is just doing exactly what it's built to do. There's nothing wrong with it. We just need to learn how to work with it. So here's what you wanna do instead. Maybe you've heard this phrase before, seek first to understand. So, Instead of fighting yourself, you want to look at, okay, like for me, I had to look at what, why was I actually wanting to binge? Where was that urge coming from? I had to start trying to understand it. Once I did this, once I actually started understanding it, instead of this kind of confusion, this fighting myself, wondering what was wrong with me and why I couldn't get myself to stop eating what I didn't want to eat. I could actually distinguish what was going on. I could start to understand what was go going on in my conscious thinking versus what was happening in my automatic animalistic thoughts. So once I learned how to do this, I gained awareness and understanding and that allowed me to start making changes, but also just to come from a place of peace and be able to make clear conscious choices. So this is why I started seeing myself actually just stopping eating some of the foods that I used to have to keep out of the house when I was done with them. I could have like one cookie and move on. I could have two bites of ice cream and move on. It wasn't a big deal anymore because I was back in the driver's seat. So again, it's not about willpower. Trying harder isn't gonna get you anywhere. Instead, what you want to do is understand why you're doing what you're doing in the first place and actually deal with that because the overeating, the emotional eating, the binge eating is just a symptom. Okay, so I want to give you some questions to start to ask yourself to actually clarify that, clarify why you're doing what you're doing. So here are some of the questions. Um, what's causing me to feel this drive to binge? or overeat or emotionally eat? How have I set myself up to end up wanting to eat a lot later? Why do I want to eat this much? How am I actually creating this problem? I'll give you one example here. I told you my coach used common sense for me. Now it was common sense, but I still just wasn't aware of it because I didn't know how to think about it. But what I didn't realize is that I would eat a bunch and then the next day I would skip a bunch of meals. 
in order to make up for what I ate the day before. But because I skipped all those meals, you know what I needed, wanted to do ravenously later? Eat a bunch of food. So this cycle would just endlessly continue. I needed to stop just skipping meals all day long. That's just one thing I did, but it's a great example of how I was setting myself up to then want to binge later. I'll give you a couple of other examples of, from some clients that I've worked with who've also used this tool. So one of my clients, her name was Rachel. Now she had been in a lifetime, decades in and out of dieting. Um, and since she was a child, weight loss was like the biggest goal and struggle of her life. Um, she had been in and out of countless diets and she always wanted to lose the same 10 or 20 pounds. Now, what would happen is she'd often get on some kind of diet or program and she would lose that 10 to 20 pounds. But for whatever reason, whenever she hit that mark, she would then immediately go back to all the same old behaviors and gain it back. So maybe you've been caught in this cycle before. So when we started working together, we started looking at, okay, well, what's causing you to self-sabotage and go back to your old behaviors after you lose that 10 to 20? So I asked her, what do you think about when you get to that point, that 10 to 20 pound mark? What do you think about? And she thought about it and she's like, well, I think, man, you know, I've reached my goal. I deserve a break. So guys, if you need a break, you haven't been on a process that you actually wanted to keep up that will last. This is a telltale sign. So together, Rachel and I started putting together a plan that she actually wanted to follow, like actually wanted to follow, really wanted to follow. So in about two weeks of putting that together, not only did she stop binge eating without having to fight herself for it, but she didn't have the desire to. She was creating a healthy lifestyle on her own terms that she actually loved exercising in ways that she enjoyed, eating in ways that she enjoyed. A few weeks after that, she added the same thing to her workouts after she'd done it with food. And after that, she was consistent for several more months. Then she was just bringing friends in. She was telling them, hey, you gotta, you gotta start doing it in a way that you actually enjoy. She had, so this is what's required to keep it up long-term. Okay, I'll give you another example. Um, this client of mine, her name was Karen. So Karen, now she was, um, well, she is, she's a runner, a lawyer, a mom of two, fit, active person, very disciplined. She's actually an ultra runner. She, she runs miles and miles and miles. And when she and I met, she'd actually just finished um, a period where she had been in a dieting program that had lasted three years where she had eaten what she called perfectly. But when we met that had met that had just ended and she got to a place where she called it screw it bill, where she was eating bags and bags of chips every night. She felt totally out of control. And she came to me and she was like, Michelle, I just need someone to hold me accountable. That's the only thing that's ever worked for me. I just need to get back inside a community or program. I need someone to hold me to it. But rather than do just that, similar to Rachel, we just kind of questioned that. It was weird to me personally that Karen did so well when she was inside this community and program, but as soon as she was left to her own devices, she went to this screw it fell. Like, that's weird. Why would you do that if you actually liked where you were at? So together we looked at, okay, what are what were some unnecessarily food rules that she had? What were some rules about exercise she had that she actually didn't want to follow? What was the way she was judging other people and herself about their bodies? She would say things like they've let themselves go. She would look at these different bodies and think, oh, that person's fat. I never want to be like that. All these judgments she had. We started actually breaking some of those and getting rid of some of those and replacing some of those. 
we started allowing foods, some of the foods that she loved, like she loved cake. She was like afraid to go to a birthday party because of how much cake she'd eat. Okay, so we started allowing back cake back in. We started allowing a little wine back in and changing the way she thought about herself, her body and others. In four weeks after that, not only was she not eating bags and bags of chips every night anymore, but she was able to go to birthday parties and have one slice of cake and be done. She was able to have a glass of wine, a couple glasses of wine in the week, and then eat healthy in a way she really enjoyed and thought was actually good for her. In 12 weeks later, she actually started losing some weight without doing any sort of strict dieting, without having massive amounts of accountability. And the best thing, I think, is that she told me she loved her body the way it was. Even though she just lost a couple of pounds, she loved her body the way it was. She wasn't worried about losing more weight. She was just, it was just happening. She didn't need anyone to look over her shoulder anymore. Okay, so that is our first key. We're going on to number two next. So key number two, you can learn to trust yourself around any food. Yes, absolutely any food, sugar, chocolate, cookies, you can learn to trust yourself around it. So I'll explain this to you with a little bit of um, out of food example. So when I was a kid, I felt like there were certain things I just struggled with that I was just born with. And maybe you can relate to this, maybe not the same things, but some other things. So I was known as being some, a kid who was quiet, shy, a procrastinator, slow at making decisions, not, athle not athletic. These are just a few of the things, right? And I thought that these were just who I was. But fortunately, I was blessed by, as I grew older, getting surrounded by a couple of mentors who taught me that really anything can be learned and I could change. I didn't have to just define myself by these things. So one by one, the things that I didn't really like or weren't working for me, I started to change them. And most of the time they were based on um, something that was just, I needed that, that personality trait to go away to be able to progress. So for example, becoming a trainer for me. Um, I couldn't be shy. I couldn't be quiet. Not when I was training a big boot camp class or training clients, they had to hear me. So I had to be loud and I had to be athletic. So I got mentors to teach me both of those things. I literally had a mentor to teach me how to make my voice loud enough to be heard. Um, and I remember the very day she congratulated on me on gaining my own voice. So experiences like these taught me that I could really learn anything. And I think this is one thing I had in my favor. So when I heard about people struggling with um, eating disorders, with binge eating, stuff like that, I heard a lot of this idea that you have to just manage this the rest of your life. And you have to avoid certain triggers in order to be able to do well. You have to avoid certain foods so you don't eat them. But I think this is a load of BS. So when I struggled with control around food, I knew that all I needed to do was learn a skill. I just hadn't figured out how yet, okay? And that skill was trusting myself around food. So once I learned how to do that, I no longer had to worry about getting too hungry, getting too emotional, procrastinating. I didn't have to worry about being bored. I didn't have to worry about re being around foods that I used to be out of control around because I had trust in myself to control my behavior. So now you're probably wondering, okay, I get it, but how do I build my trust in myself around food? How do I actually do that? So I like to say it's a little bit, <laughs> think of it like building something like courage. Building trust is a lot like building courage. How do you build courage? 
Well, to build courage, you have to do courageous things. You have to just be courageous, right? So how do you build trust? Through practice. The problem is people, when they don't trust themselves around certain foods, they avoid those foods. And so in avoiding them, they actually never get a chance to build trust in themselves. They never get a chance to learn that skill. So you have to actually give yourself a chance to practice it. Now, you can take it in small steps. You know, if you don't know how to swim, you don't just dunk your whole head in the water. You go gradually, you take your toes first, but you can build trust. And I should say, you know, you can get away with never kind of, never building that trust. And you can still be able to stop binge eating. You can still be able to manage your food pretty well. But I think you'll end up making your life smaller because you'll have to continue relying on that management and control. You'll have to keep avoiding triggering foods like, like Karen had to. She had to avoid birthday parties. What kind of life is that? Having to be that careful, being scared of the holidays, being afraid of getting too hungry. These are like, this is a small way to live. But if you can build your trust in yourself, your life can expand. You can get your power back and freedom to do whatever you want. So I'll give you a couple of real life examples of this with a couple of clients I worked with. So I had a client, her name was Marissa, and she's a college counselor. At the time that we started working together, she just got into a serious relationship. And she told me she wanted to feel like she didn't have this kind of shameful secret of binge eating to keep from him. So that was really motivating her. And she had a particular food, and she had a few different foods, but this is one of them, that was a trigger food for her that she couldn't have in the house or she'll eat it all. And that was Ben and Jerry's ice cream, okay? So she told me she just wouldn't, she'd avoid buying it. But the problem was she'd avoid buying it at the grocery store, but later in the day when she was tired, when work was over, when her inhibitions were down, she'd end up just order, ordering it on Uber Eats. So she'd end up spending more and buying it and, and she'd eat all of it, the whole pint. So when we got to work, we started working on her mindset around food and her body. And about a week or two in when she was feeling a little bit better, we had her actually go buy that ice cream. Okay, when she went to the grocery store, <laughs> when she would normally only get healthy foods, when she had all of her willpower up, she bought that Ben and Jerry's. And she did that. And a couple of weeks went by, excuse me, and we got on a coaching call together. And she said, or I actually checked in with her on it. I was like, okay, hey, you know, how's that Ben and Jerry's doing? I remember you bought it a couple of weeks ago. How's it doing? And she told me, oh my gosh, Michelle, I forgot that I bought that. It's still in the freezer. When I got brought it home, I had like a bite or two. And I thought to myself, it's not really as good as it used to be. And then I just put it back. So it is possible, absolutely. Here's another example. I had a client, her name was Maggie. Um, she was a cook, a sweet auntie, a mom. And she had actually, when we met, had actually lost a bunch of weight using an app called Noom. Maybe you're familiar with it, but she had gotten to a point where she had lost, I think it was like 60 pounds, but she hit a plateau. She couldn't seem to get any further than that. And she said, the reason is because she still struggled with binge eating. So she could only get so far. Now, mind you, Maggie, before um, she started working with me, had also overcome alcoholism and had overcome drug addiction. So she'd overcome these things. She knew that she could overcome this. She just had to learn how. But the issue was, unlike drugs and alcohol, she couldn't just go cold turkey when it came to food. You can't just cut food out of your life. 
<laughs> it's going to be there. So she had to build trust in herself around food. Plus, to top it off, she's a cook, right? She works with food all day long. And so when we sat down together, we started looking at, okay, well, what are the silly little rules you have about food that you don't need to follow, you don't want to follow? We started allowing foods that she used to have limited. We started looking about some of the thoughts and behaviors she had around food, like after work, she would always feel like she needed to throw out the food or before she ate it all, but she'd usually end up eating it anyway. I mean, the leftovers after work. So we did all this, and as a result, she could do things that she couldn't do before. Like, for example, she was able to throw that food out without eating any of it. She was able to have Oreos, which used to be a huge trigger food for her, and stop before the whole package was gone. So not only was binge eating, or not only now is binge eating gone for good for her, but she eats a healthy diet that she's actually proud of. She has Oreos on occasion and that's fine. She exercises regularly because she wants to. And she's so confident in it. She has so much trust in herself that she actually started a community online for people using the app called Noom, um, so where she helps them actually learn how to use it in a way that helps people who struggle with binge eating. So they don't have to go back to those old habits and patterns. Okay, that brings us to the final key. Key number three, support and vulnerability are what break the cycle of shame. So let me remind you that I did spend years, and I mean years, over eight, trying to do this on my own, trying to break free from this binge eating problem. I didn't want help because I was supposed to be the best. I was supposed to be a health and fitness guru. Um, I thought I shouldn't need help. I, so I read books on addiction. I took programs online. I went in group courses where I just hid in the background. I took nutrition courses. I tried tons of different diets. I tried over and over on my own. But all that time, I was keeping it a secret. There was a sparse few who even knew what was going, what I was struggling with. I kept wondering what was wrong with me, but not wanting to admit that anything was. I, can, I was just alone and I continued to feel just like I wasn't okay, I wasn't worthy. So fortunately, one day, a mentor of mine, shared with me something that really got me thinking differently. He said, you can't wait to feel worthy. You have to act worthy and then you'll feel worthy. So in other words, you have to actually treat yourself like you're worth something <laughs> in order to experience feeling like you're worth something. Okay, so for me, that meant I needed to show myself that, hey, you know what? I might be embarrassed by this problem, but I'm worth the help. It's worth the help. So I hired a coach where I wasn't able to hide anymore, where I had to get vulnerable, where I had skin in the game and had to share because I had to make it work. I chose to act work worthy instead of ashamed. So again, Support here is vital. It's not just for accountability. Um, it's really just for the power of what happens when you're no longer just keeping it to yourself, when it's no longer a secret. When you don't have it be a secret anymore, it, it's, it's an expression of this isn't anything I need to be ashamed of. So what support did for me is it shifted me from, I hope this will work, to this has to work. It shifted me from this is shameful and I should have it together to, you know what, it's okay that I have this problem and it's worth getting fixed. 
And it gave me the power of having someone else join me. Human connection with someone who saw me for who I was and helped me to keep going forward. So when it comes to body image, this is probably the most important thing that we'll talk about today. Because you might know that your worth is not completely based on, for example, your weight or even your body itself. But you won't feel that way until you start acting like it. You won't someday just magically feel like, you know, you're okay at any weight. You have to act like it first. And that's what Karen did. The example of someone who, whoa, for the first time she loved her body. She didn't even want to love her body. She just wanted to lose weight when we started working together. But that changed because she started acting differently to herself. So again, today I'm constantly giving myself support and being vulnerable with things that I'm struggling with. And it always pays off. So even as a personal trainer, I have my own trainer. I hire experts to help me to get better at what I do, improve my health, even though I help people with their health. Um, recently, I went traveling. I went abroad to Africa. And I ate a bunch of weird foods, and I felt bloated. I felt like my, my digestion was all getting messed up. And I remember I went out in a swimsuit. Anyway, because I knew I need to show up for myself vulnerably, I need to express to myself that, hey, you know what, even though you feel kind of yucky and you feel kind of gross, you're worthy. And I only do, could do that through action. So these things have gotten me to places I never would have gotten if I hadn't had the support and the connection and sharing what was going on. So I'll give you just one example of this with um, one of the clients that I worked with besides Karen earlier. So this client, her name was Teresa. And she's actually a bodybuilder. She was 11% body fat, a fitness coach as well. And she struggled with binge eating in the background. She had so much shame and obsession about food that she was super unhappy. She wasn't even dating because she didn't feel worthy in her own skin, but she wanted to be. She supported everyone else around, you know, their bodies, but inside she was hurting about her own. And so she hired me because she wanted to break that cycle of shame. And you know what? Just the act of starting to work with me and talking about it massively shifted the shame for her. She started connecting and sharing and learning that nothing was wrong with her. And you know what happened? The crazy thing is she actually instantly stopped binge eating, literally from our first call. Now, two weeks in, she binged again. But this time, this is where support is helpful yet again. She didn't have to worry. Instead of just going straight to, oh, I'm a failure, I can't do this, together we just sat down and we learned something more about what was going to help her to move forward. Okay, so we were able to learn from what happened in that binge to help her to learn moving forward so that she wouldn't do it again. And we found out she'd just been under fueling at lunch. She'd been tempted by sweets at work, but that was because she was under fueling at lunch. So we started fueling her better, allowing some sweets in her, in her lunch, and the cravings faded away. Again, the binge eating stopped. This time it didn't come back. Five months later, she called me to share how she was doing. She was like, and we weren't working together at this point five months later. She was like, I'm so much happier. I'm not binge eating. I'm dating again. I've joined a new fitness community where we're not just focused on chiseling our bodies to perfection but we're just taking care of our health. She gained a couple of pounds of muscle because she was actually eating the right amounts for, that she needed. So she was doing tons better. All right, so we'll do a little recap here. The keys are, number one, there's nothing wrong with you. All you need to do is start understanding the way your brain works and the way you work. Stop fighting yourself and start understanding what's driving you to do these things anyway. What's driving that self-sabotage? 
Number two, you can learn to trust yourself around any food. Trust is a skill. Trust is a practice. Trust is something that you build. And number three, support and vulnerability are what break the cycle of shame. You want to stop experiencing shame. You need to get out there and be vulnerable. You can take small steps, but you got to do that. Okay, so we haven't talked about what specific behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs are keeping you stuck on an individual basis or what specific things you can start doing in your life to start building trust in yourself around foods and situations that would trigger you or like what getting support means for you. So that's why I'm actually offering today a free 60 minute call to anyone who's on this live and I'll help you clarify exactly what thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors are keeping you stuck fighting yourself and help you actually start coming from a place of understanding, understanding what's going on for you so you can break free from this cycle and start following through on a healthy lifestyle you want without it consuming and destroying your mental health. So again, if you're not aware of what's driving you to self-sabotage, overeat, binge eat, it's just an endless battle with yourself. You might lose weight. You might eat perfectly, quote unquote, for three years, like my client Karen did, but then it just goes back to the same. And you know it does. And you can ignore the problem, but it's at the cost of what? Your trust in yourself, feeling bad about it, continuing to put off the things that binge eating and overeating and numbing have been keeping you from accomplishing. So for in order for us to address those individual struggles, we have to talk on an individual level, just like my coach did for me. And in order to get clear on exactly what you need to end your struggle with diet and food in your body, you can set up a free call with me here today. Um, how you do that, um, we'll all be sharing in the chat here and by word of mouth, but just in the chat so you can see it, my phone number. It is 253-273-7045. And what you can do is you can text me, text me two things. One, your name, <laughs> so I know who you are. And number two, which of these three keys spoke to you the most? most? What did you hear that spoke to you the most? And then what we'll do is we'll set up a time to have that consult. And again, what we do on that consult is we just clarify your individual thoughts, behaviors, and beliefs, what ones are driving you to binge eat and self-sabotage. And I'll teach you how you can start coming from a place of understanding and reversing those. And that's important because without knowing what's going on and causing that, again, you're just trying hard, you're controlling yourself, but that doesn't last very long. It's just all willpower. It's fleeting. It's not sustainable. So that's why I'm offering this, this free 60 minute call where I'll teach you how to really break free and end this cycle for good. So, oh, and I wanna give one more option here. If you prefer, some people do, if you prefer email, you can also do email and you can reach me at coachmichelleho at gmail.com. That's the best email to reach me. And it's in the chat box for you for the spelling with my last name, Ho. So, okay, that is it. Thank you again so much for being here. I'm looking forward to talking to some of you on an individual level. And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for you being here. And um, yeah, we can open it up for any questions if we want. Have a couple of minutes. All right, we're going to say goodbye to our Facebook Live friends. Thanks so much for tuning in and stay in touch.